Einek expresses displeasure over conflicting court orders and the NJC orders probe of three erring judges. Plus, ahead of the 2023 elections, there are suggestions that ABC leaders want to lure President Goodluck Jonathan into the party. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Cole. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has expressed displeasure over the conflicting orders emanating from the courts of coordinate jurisdiction, describing it as a threat to its work and democratic development in Nigeria. Also, the National Judicial Council, NJC, has okayed the probe of three judges for granting ex parte orders that were considered an embarrassment to the judiciary. Well, joining us uh, to discuss this is Associate Professor of Law uh, at the River State University, uh, Professor Richard Wakocha, and former Vice President of the Nigeria Bar Association, Mondi Obani. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you for Great. having us. Well, uh, Professor, I'm going to start with you, obviously, because um, I'm guessing that young lawyers that are the ones who are intending to be lawyers, the ones who sit in your classrooms every day and are watching the news or reading newspapers, would really be wondering if this should be the profession they go into because there seems to be a lot of back and forth lately within the judiciary. But let me start by doing, saying this. Um, I do not understand if maybe the um, Attorney General um, has decided to wake up because this is not the first time we're having these conflicting court orders. It always happens before, during, and even after elections. So is it that now he's being alive to his responsibility, or is this a, a bit much than usual, and hence the reason why uh, everyone seems to be talking about it? Uh, well, it's always been a uh, major embarrassment, um, both for the Nigerian judiciary and the Nigerian state, by extension. Uh, because whenever there are anomalies at the judiciary, it paints the picture outside that you have a banana republic where things are remote control. Um, it's always been a problem. Is that the general just waking up? I, I, I'm not too sure that the general has anything to do with this. I think the uh, Chief Justice of Nigeria uh, is probably being a little more proactive this time than they were in previous times. And so uh, we're seeing him take steps that we hadn't taken um, on previous occasions. So I think it's a good development that one way or the other way, uh, try to keep in check uh, the keepers of our gate of justice, because uh, a lot about stability and justice in society depends on them. And the stability of society, and on our, especially of our democracy, also depends on them. So I think the CJN is doing a little uh, better than they did on previous occasions by taking steps at least to stand in the lodge of such uh, others uh, that are capable of creating confusion. I'm curious because um, the average person, the average Nigerian who might not be uh, necessarily um, abreast with judicial matters would be wondering why these conflicting court orders happen. Is it as a result of interpretation of the law or is this just some form of, um, like people who, um, who have, um, some pundits who have said that, you know, it's because of the level of the rot in the system or corruption in the judicial system, hence, you know, these conflicting orders. But e e educate us, what exactly is responsible for this? Um, I'm not too sure it has much to do with law. Because when the same question comes before the same, uh, before judges of the same jurisdiction or coordinate jurisdiction, um, we expect some level of, of uh, regularity and some level of uh, similarity in what they say. Because the law is one. Uh, I know that uh, what happens all the time is people try to give different interpretations to the provisions of the law. But uh, in all, you expect to see some level of sanity. So when you have a judgment on an issue, or not even a judgment, and that's the most disturbing thing about these developments. 
interim orders. Interim orders are not judgments. They are applications that are brought before courts, very often with some level of, uh, some kind of uh, urgency implied or uh, suggested in the affidavit of, affidavit of urgency or something that they follow it. And then they will seek that the court should make an order restraining a person who has not been hard from doing something. Now, if you are talking of restraining them from doing something that is about to claim my life or that is about to affect my right adversely uh, and seriously, that is different. Uh, but to make others asking a functionary not to uh, carry out his function and all that will be a bit too hasty for the court. The usual tradition of the courts, especially for some time now after complaints about this kind of behavior, has been to say, okay, put the other party on notice. And the court will at least hear the parties before making an order uh, to maintain the status quo or, or anything uh, on the contrary. Uh, but this spate of orders being made, stop work, start work, go back to work, don't go back to work, I mean, it's an embarrassment to the judicial system. And so uh, I'm curious again, uh, this is a day of curiosities. Um, so if, is there no law that restricts one court um, from making the same decision or contrary decisions to what another court of competent jurisdiction has made? Because I remember in the case of the PDP chairman, uh, chairmanship um, issue, it was first the River State Court, and then it was another one, I think, in Calabar. And then, I mean, it just, and it's the same issue. It's not that it's a totally different issue. It's on the same issue. Is there not a way that the courts can regulate themselves so that this mess does not keep happening? Can you hear me? I, I think we're having a connection issue, but if you, if you can hear me. Oh, um, I think we're having connection issues there. We're going to try to get back uh, the professor and, of course, our second guests will join us. I think the professor is back. Uh, professor, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Now. Okay, we had a, a, a little hiccup, but go ahead. Yeah, so with respect to those issues, um, let's say the only grass I had with the first order was, uh, with the first um, interim order was, uh, that's, you have been asked to do something very severe and very serious. And uh, there was no urgency as such, uh, threatening a life or threatening a limb to warrant you are acting, uh, taking um, uh, that, that application in that manner and severing the functionality of a functionary, uh, a major functionary. So one would have expected that perhaps you would say, okay, put the other party on notice, and one week, come back and take this application. Let all the parties be complete. So my only grounds was um, the decision uh, to grant the order at the time it was granted without hearing the other party. But again, the judge is always the master of his court, and injunctions are at the discretion of the court. So if the court was convinced that the situation was so urgent that it required decapitating the other party before he can be heard, then let's say that was the court's reading of how urgent the situation was. The second judgment from, um, was it uh, Jigawa or Zamfara, one of those states, um, that dealt with the different issues. I don't consider that conflicting as well. That dealt with an application that was brought to it concerning the regularity of the purported suspension of the, the um, person involved. And the court made an order staying that suspension pending the hearing of the case. So the two of them weren't quite dealing with the same thing. The first one was dealing with the effect of suspension, whether the party shouldn't be restrained, having been suspended by his party, uh, by his constituency. The second one is dealing with the validity of the suspension, and the order was made to give reprieve to the person against whom that suspension was made, uh, staying that suspension or setting aside that suspension and allowing him to function pending the hearing of the case. So those two, for me, are not conflicting. The second one deals with the regularity of the action on the basis of which the first order was made. Mm -hmm. So it did not review the first order, as to say I'm overturning the first order. I had no conflict there. My problem, major problem, is with the one that came from Calabar. How do you make that subsequent order when a court of coordinate jurisdiction has made a pronouncement staying 
the suspension on the basis of which the first order was made. How do you go back to make an order after a court of coordinate jurisdiction is hearing the validity, uh, hearing the case on the validity of the suspension, and then you reinforce the suspension? You know, so that for me is the one that is really conflicting. I, I do not have much problem with the uh, the first order, and I do not have much problem with the second order because they weren't quite dealing with the same thing. First one was dealing with effect of suspension. Second one was dealing with regularity of the suspension. So they were different. Mm. But the third one is the one that clearly uh, uh, went uh, elsewhere and uh, acted completely out of the rules. So um, for that, that's my take on, those, on that uh, particular uh, contest. And, 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 and from what you told me, obviously, in, like you said, the. In this case, who's blamed? Because, of course, uh, three judges have been invited by the CJN. Um, and in the last case that you're pointing out that, you know, um, it, it, it's conflicting, is it the judge that is to be blamed for not reviewing the first and the second case so as to know whether to back out or to know what position to take um, before making that kind of judgment? I, I think... Um the box has to end on the on the judge's table. Um, though there is a caveat there, the box ends on the judge's table because he has to take that decision. And as I said, the matter of whether or not the suspension was proper was pending in some court in the north. You may raise another question whether the court in the north has jurisdiction to review action of uh, party members in the south. That's a different question uh, that may also uh, constitute an abuse if it has no jurisdiction to deal with a matter that is not within its area. And then for the uh, the court in Calabar, the two questions we are already before two different courts, the uh, effect of the suspension and the validity of the suspension. So there was no room for you to exercise jurisdiction again on a matter that is already pending in another court. But the caveat I said we have to take is the fact that a judge is not expected to operate uh, on the basis of a news item on, on a newspaper or uh, television or radio. It is the responsibility of the parties involved to bring facts before the court. Uh, and I am sure that parties brought facts. Uh, of course, only one party was before the court. Uh, the other party uh, was yet to come before the court. That was also an interim order. So in the circumstance, uh, it, it made uh, a bit of a mockery uh, of the judicial process. Okay, but let's... again, yes, uh, key thing there is the judge had not had the privilege of hearing the other party, and given the circumstance, there was no hurry. He should have made an order for the third party to be served and facilitated hearing of the matter if it's a prayer's against. Hmm. Uh, I think we're just being joined by uh, Barrister Dr. Monday Obani. Uh, <laughs> Barrister Obani, uh, sometimes I forget that you're a doctor. It's good to have you join us. Thank you for, for having me. And good evening to your special guest. All right. Good evening, Monday. Let, let, let me Hello, throw sir. the same question that I posed to the professor earlier on, because obviously the NBA is watching from the sidelines and seeing that the court, which we mostly refer to as the hope of the common man, seems to be playing out right in front of us as some form of uh, a dramatic scene in a Shakespearean novel. Um, so... As, as someone who is part of this very learned body, um, where do you stand on, on these conflicting court orders? Uh, well, thank you once again. Uh, we find out that our judiciary sometimes uh, engage in some, some level of oddities, you know, when political cases are involved. It didn't start today. Uh, most times our politicians, uh, with their neighbor's hands, have inflicted virtually every profession and they are delving into the legal profession and then trying to mess up the judicial sector uh, with these contradictory expertise orders you know the additional uh, right left center giving an impression as if it is now uh, purchasable you can walk into the judiciary and make it look as a black market where you can buy any judgment at any point in time the the happenings within that that sector is very, very, uh, I mean, it's shocking. it's shocking because one, most of these decisions are getting extracted really. 
even uh, beyond the area where the matter is domiciled. Imagine going to Dick Kevin now, these states are very close to the Republic. In matters that may have probably arisen down south and has no thing to do with the with those uh, territories. And they go there and then meanwhile uh, they obtain most of the others ex parte. Ex parte means that the other party is not put on notice. In other words, the court relies on the fact of only one party without the evidence of the other party, uh, you know, contradicting or agreeing or affirming whatever has been said by the other party. It's, it's clearly, clearly a bit strange. And I'm very happy the reaction of the CJN over this, you know, and then promising that uh, disciplinary measures this time around will be taken against the hearing judges. On our own part, too, as lawyers, we're also examining what the lawyers who filed these processes know did. Is it clearly ethical? Or is this something that we deserve a recommendation for disciplinary measures? So I think that that idea that people are not happy, you know, that there is this concerted effort now being made by both batch, by, by and bench in order to address this issue squarely, is something that is very confronting. Meaning that from now onwards, it's not going to be business as usual. <laughs> Um, but so Bani, you said at the beginning uh, when you were trying to make your point that um, that you said we and we there meaning the judiciary have allowed um, politicians to come and play and and not quoting you directly but that you said something like that so it's more like a black market of sorts so it means that the judiciary has opened itself up because when you say they have come into it means that somebody opened the door for it to be done and like i said at the beginning of this conversation it's not the first time we're hearing these kinds of conflicting orders um so obviously we have lawyers who have actually allowed themselves to either be played by the politicians or they themselves are now somewhat uh, of politicians um so how where do you start even in sanitizing the system we see the cgn and what she's doing um but some of these lawyers are very highly placed lawyers. Um, will the hammer of the law, because you know, when I was growing up, my, my grandfather used to say that um, the, the justice system is blind to all and sundry, but that the one in Nigeria has an open eye, one eye open and sees the child of this person or that person or the man who's rich and the man who's poor. Do we see, um, will, will we be seeing in the future uh, the, the strong arm of the law coming down on these airing uh, judicial officers or not? This report refers the higher and mighty being punished uh, within the, the legal circle. I mean, we have had senior advocates of Nigeria who uh, was stripped of his rank. He's not only one person, uh, up to two or three now, uh, within the rank of uh, senior advocate of Nigeria. We have had instances like that. Uh, being a senior advocate does not grant anyone an ability to do a manner of things within the profession and get away with it. I don't think. In fact, the more uh, senior you become, the more responsible you should be in the profession, the more you can the matter. And in coming to a privileged position of being a senior advocate of Nigeria, is a privilege. That also entrusts upon you additional responsibility apart from being a lawyer. You are now a leader of the bar. And so the best practices, you know, the kind of a uh, character an integrity that you should expect, you know, is something that, like, you know, it must be above board. It must be, a, you know, like Caesar's wife, you know, being in that, you know, position. So I don't think that any lawyer will argue uh, because he's a senior advocate of Nigeria of being uh, too wealthy or too big that he cannot in any way face uh, disciplinary measures when he offends the, the basic uh, code of professional conduct, you know. So I think uh, uh, we have to discard that idea that being big in the profession gives you or grants you an immunity. Also, within the bench, we have seen many judges who have actually been punished. You know, remember under Justice Owais, who was the CJN then, uh, many lawyers who were issuing out expert orders, you know, got clearly disciplined. Is there in the record that many judges who have been asked to go? That many who have been dismissed in the in the in the job, you know, because of certain things they or certain orders they dished out. That were clearly, clearly unlawful, you know. So I don't have this belief that anyone can become so big in this country, especially within the legal profession, and do anything and get away with it. And then that grants you because it's so big and so large and a large has large pocket, then it will now exclude him from being punished and all that. I don't believe in that, and I don't think that 
anyone should entertain any fear concerning punishment, you know, being meted out to erring lawyers or judges. I, I, I really have, I feel the urge to push you further on this issue of not believing. You not believing and it being a reality are two different things. You may not believe that there are people who can go scot-free, but in reality, there might be people who can go scot-free. But I'll leave it that. That's not a question that you need to answer. Let's talk about what INEC is speaking about here. And I'm going to go back to the professor right after you. I, I, INEC has, you know, um, said that they are displeased with this, you know, conflicting court orders. Uh, professor Mahmoud Yacoub talked about the fact that he knows about cases that, in fact, I'd like to quote him directly, that there are still cases that are still in court. He's aware of them and they're therefore subjudice. He even says that some of these cases um, are making the work of INEC very difficult and that they've been crying out loud for a long time. I quote him, in particular, some pre-election litigations relating to the nomination of candidates for elections were not determined until after elections. And here we are again, getting ready for 2023. In fact, the case that has uh, that has caused all of this conflicting orders is also movements within a particular political party gearing up for 2023. So if we cannot sort these things out now, more might come in 2023, won't it? Certainly. Uh, if, you don't stop, if you don't stop what is going on now, uh, you're definitely going to have a repeat of uh, 2019 in 2023. Uh, I'm a bit happy it's starting a bit early this time. Uh, but the fact that it's starting early does not guarantee that it can end early. Neither does it guarantee that it can create confusion that will affect the electoral process and the work of INEC. It certainly will affect the work of INEC because um, uh, there will be a lot of indecision based on uh, what is prevailing, what the courts have said, what they should do and what they should not do, who they should accept and who they should not accept. So definitely we are on the same road. We are heading to the same market. And unless something happens differently, uh, even the long time we have now between now and the election time won't amount to much uh, because it can still end up dragging until it affects the electoral process. So I think Mahmoud is right. Uh, Barstow Bani, we also know that the election calendar is, is the way it is right now because obviously of certain cases that lingered. I mean, we no longer have general elections in terms of governorship elections right across the country, uh, you know, at the same time. And, and I mean, a, a clear example is the fact that we're going to the polls in Anambra come November. I think November 6th, if I'm not mistaken. And then it's almost the same for some other states. And that's because of these same lingering court cases. But will there ever be a synchronized calendar for our elections in the future if we can, one way or the other, regulate our judicial system and the processes that come with it, even though there are people who are also advocating, even I think the president had been advocating for um, election uh, judiciary, judiciary of sorts that would help, you know, to sanitize the system right after elections. Uh, yeah, these acts are very disruptive. You know, I'm talking about uh, the intervention of the judiciary in our electoral process. And that's why we must do everything humanly possible to guarantee the fairness and credibility of the process. If a uh, uh, mandate is given at the polling unit, you know, at the polling booth, it reduces the, in a fair manner, it reduces the court coming in sometimes to engage in disruptive uh, uh, process, you know, that now make the election timetable, you know, to be uh, skewed. A number has already pointed that the election is taking place uh, in November, whereas the general election took place uh, in 2019. I think there has took place either before then or, you know, yeah, before that time, because there was a disruption. So other states, so many other states are also involved in that. So the fairness of the system is what we should uh, strive, and that is where INEC comes in. INEC has some of their, their, their problems too. Uh, most times, they also compromise. That is not to work out. Sometimes, the fairness of the process also is is, uh, is questionable. So we must start by getting our electoral process to be fair. When we get our electoral process to be fair in such a manner that the mandate is given at the polling booth or the polling unit, then it will reduce the level of uh, interference of the judiciary. And when judiciary do not come in to determine the mandate of people who occupy political office, we may begin to have 
confidence being bestowed upon the electoral process. So we must try as much as possible to guarantee the fairness of the electoral process. And that means that even the electoral law itself must start by removing some of the defective uh, clauses or provisions that have made the electoral fairness not to be guaranteed. One of which is the issue of uh, electronic deployment of electoral, uh, I mean, uh, technology in our electoral process. One of which is that we must begin to vote electronically. We must also transmit our results electronically. I don't know what is the state of the law with regards to what the House is doing with that regard. We, they have not told us. They have gone on break and they have not probably concluded on that. And INEC is willing to actually conduct election de with deployment of technology, including transmission of electronic uh, results. So we should begin to look, think out with our legal framework, look at the fairness of the process, ensure that our mindset is towards having free and fair election. If we do all that, the judiciary will play little or no role in trying to change the mandate or do anything that will uh, actually you know, appear disruptive. Okay, and finally, because we have to go, Professor Wakocha, lastly, um, there are people who have the opinion that the judiciary has had too much power over the electoral process and they should not be deter the court should not be determining who sits in what office. Um, and that means that we need to, like Baris Albani said, um, you know, sanitize the electoral process. But how do we get the judiciary to hands off? Because many have complained, especially in the case of the Zamfara state governor, where he, you know, he, he was not supposedly the winner per se, but the courts installed him. And this is Dito for so many other people. Is that even realizable uh, in, in the future, that the courts or the tribunals will not have a, the power to install a person as opposed to the ballot? Well, let's remember that first, uh, the courts do not jump in and install people. They get invited. Uh, as uh, Mr. Barney has said, um, if we get the processes to be fair, if you have an election contest in which parties are fairly treated and results clearly and as clearly as possible represent the outcome of people's vote, you will have less contestation. Uh, and so first, we will eliminate some of the cases by ensuring that the process is fair and that um, those who partake in it will have less cost uh, to complain about the outcome. Once we do that, and we ensure that every misconduct carries a price, both for the practitioner of politics, uh, he also said that, and that's extremely important, those who engage in the improper behaviors should face a threat that is stronger than the benefit they get from engaging in the lawlessness. Because it is where there is less or no punishment for misconduct, that misconduct trends and blooms. Okay. And so if we address those parts, it will reduce what goes to the cause. The courts are helpless. You take the cases to them, and once the case is filed, the court will, have, court will have to make a pronouncement one way or okay. the other on the facts presented before it. Uh, Professor w Richard Wakocha, uh, Dr. Mondo Bani, thank you very much for being part of this conversation. We appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break. And when we return, political pundits suggest the All Progressive Congress APC leaders are keeping an eye on the former president. Good luck, Jonathan. We'll get to find out after this break.